On this episode of The School of Muscle, lifetime, professional, natural bodybuilder, 3DMJ godfather, Jeff Alberts. So the first place that I'd kind of like to start here, Jeff, is just kind of uh, getting us up to speed on where you're at in prep right now, maybe how long you've been dieting, what your game plan is moving forward, and just kind of giving, getting us up to speed with that sort of thing. All right. So yeah, let's see. I don't have really a specific target I'm shooting for as far as um, you know, specific shows. I would, I would like to hit the California Muscle Mayhem in July. Um, just because Eric Collins is going to be competing there too. And that's where we actually met each other um, like 10 years ago. So it'd be kind of cool to kind of reunite on stage with him. But I mean, if it, if it happens, great. If it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't. Cause basically what's the most important thing for me is bringing my best. And if I just, you know, I can't make it at that timeline, then I'll just extend it out and find a later show. So we could be saying we're about 20 weeks out. Um, and right now I'm about 17 pounds over. So it's not to say it's not doable. Um, but I like to kind of just see how things go. And the last thing I want to do is let's say, you know, try to rush the process. Um, mm-hmm. so it, it, so it negatively impacts that end product. So we can say we're 20 weeks out. Um, as far as like when I started this particular prep, um, I kind of started it in September, but it wasn't like full bore. It was more like, okay, let me just take a few off here, coast a little bit there. And so I kind of just been chipping away at it. Um, you know, Thanksgiving rolled around, like I'm going to enjoy the holidays, you know, Christmas. So it was kind of a little bit of a, you know, on off type of video. Um, but since January, it's been basically go time. Cool. And is there a certain like rate of weight loss that you're shooting for? Well, right now I'm like, okay, I need to get off, you know, closer to that pound per week. Um, but unfortunately, my body is just um, not as respondent as I would like it to be. And the big part of that is just I'm not a very active person. Um, so I'm sitting here at my desk, you know, working with clients online. So I don't really move a lot. And the weather hasn't been the greatest out here. Like right, right now it's raining. I'm like, great. So Saturday it's going to be raining all day. So it's just been a little frustrating from that side of it. It's like, man, I wanted to do, be more active. You know, I have two kids that are highly active. So, you yeah. know, I want to get out there and do things with them. So it's just like, okay, I got to do a lot of cardio. Otherwise it's just not going to happen. So lately I've been kind of getting a little more assertive with, you know, lowering calories down, pushing cardio up. Um, and I'm kind of turning into one of those horror stories you hear about online, Yeah. but at the same time, I'm ensuring that, uh, you know, I'm not really, you know, getting too, too crazy with how aggressive I'm getting. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where I'm at with that type of a deal. So it's like, yeah, I'm shooting for a pound a week at the very least. Like I want to get at least a half a pound off. Um, but no more than a pound. Like I can tell you from you, from past preps that I've done where I've, you know, where fat loss was easy to come by because I was more active and I was getting mm-hmm. upwards of like pound and a half week off a, a pound and a half a week, or maybe up to two pounds. I got to stay shredded, but 10 pounds lighter than what I am lately. And so mm-hmm. it was like just a smaller version of myself. So I don't want to like, again, affect the end product and have like, you just look like flat and drawn out type of a bodybuilder. Right. So you're kind of finding that balance between making sure you're still losing at a decent rate, but not pushing it too hard to where you're losing muscle and that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. And also too, you know, I'm, I guess you can say I'm kind of a lifestyle bodybuilder now where I don't want to, let's say, push the pace too fast just because my overall mood isn't going to be all that great. Like, you know, energy levels, um, just, you know, being irritable and that type of a deal, being overly stressed. Cause again, I'm a dad, I'm, you know, I'm a husband and the last thing I want to be is like an asshole, yeah. you know, for, for 30 weeks, you know? So, you know, I have to think about those things too. Um, so it's just not all about, Hey, let's get shredded and win a show. It's like, yeah, it'd be great. But at the same time, I want my family in the audience, not like, Hey, you're an asshole. I'm not going to your show. So that's important to me that I try to like life outside the gym. Like Mm -hmm. it's hard, but try not to have bodybuilding impact that. And that's right. That's a tall order. And 
even like yesterday, like I was wiped out and I had a hard RDL session the day before. And my wife said, I just told my wife, I'm wrecked. She's like, I see it all over your face. Like I was just trash. So yesterday was just one of those days where I'm like, you know what? It's probably best. I just don't even train and just eat and chill and to recover. Um, so yeah, that was a little long winded, but yeah. No, no. And even like, I've never dieted down for a contest prep or anything like that, but even just doing like a standard cut, it can be kind of difficult to manage some of those life stresses and things like that. And is there anything with, with your experience that you're doing now that you're making sure that helps you maintain those relationships and kind of your outside life a little bit better when Mm -hmm. you are going through these phases? Yeah. Just having awareness and realizing that, you know, I'm making the decision to compete and to put myself through this. You know, my family doesn't decide that or my wife doesn't decide that. I do. So it's kind of not fair or be selfish of me to think of myself first and say, OK, everybody around me needs to cater to me because, oh, I'm prepping. Mm-hmm. So I just have awareness. And, you know, days like yesterday where it's just like I feel terrible. Um, I was like, OK, you know, try to put a smile on your face, try to do, go out of your way a little bit more to not negatively impact, you know, the da- the dynamic, you know, otherwise, um, you know, I admit like with my first wife, it was it was the opposite. It was like I was in my 20s, my early 20s, late 20s, mm-hmm. um, even into my 30s, you know, competing. And it was all about, hey, I need to, you know, win this show. Or I need to try to get a pro card. So, you know, I would, I was selfish. It was like times where, hey, let's go out to dinner. No, I can't go out to dinner, you know? Yeah. I'm I'm prepping. So it was just like a lot of that went on. So you can say I kind of uh, lived it um, both sides of the the fence. And, you know, on the one side, back when I was younger, just the immaturity. Yeah. Like there were shows I won. Yeah, great. But, you know, behind the scenes, it just wasn't, you know, like, thank God the internet wasn't around back then, because otherwise it would have been exposed. Like, man, that guy's an asshole. So, yeah, I mean, there's like you see things online like, oh, that guy's shredded. He's he's winning shows. But you kind of have to ask yourself, well, at what cost? You know, mm-hmm. did he do it? You know, keeping everything outside the gym intact. Um, so that's something that I like right now at this stage of my career anyways, yeah, it's great to win or whatever, but it's really not the most important thing for me. Like I just enjoy the, like I said, the lifestyle of it. And, you know, I can do my Monday through Friday, be, be pretty, pretty on top of things, pretty hardcore, but Saturday, Sunday rolls around, you know, it's, you know, I'm going to make sure that I'm doing things for the family and trying to have fun and that type of stuff. Yeah. And is there anything in particular that kind of helped you flip that switch of, okay, there's, there's more more here than just winning this show. There's other things too, or was it just kind of having to experience it and go through it, or what kind of helped with that? Yeah, it's kind of like a slow transition over time because we're talking like I first started competing in the early '90s, and here we are, 2019. I can't believe I'm still doing it, but yeah, it's yeah. like it's just a kind of a slow process. But I would say the prep I had in 2002, it was a it was a good prep like an awesome prep. Like I was perfect. Like I didn't cheat on my diet. Not once. It was like, it was probably the only prep I could say where I was perfect mm-hmm. in that regards. Um, like just everything. Like, I think I missed one cardio session and that's cause I went to a, a basketball game, but outside of that, I was like rock solid. And that, that was an awesome prep, but it was a shitty prep at the same time. And I'll explain why, like, again, awesome because I got on stage shredded I would say out of all the shows I've done, that was the only time I felt like I got robbed out of a placing. Yeah. Um, I felt like I should have won that show and got my pro card. Um, I lost by one point. Long story short, two judges gave me fifth. All the rest gave me like ones. So mm-hmm. I was like, where do those fives come from? But anyways, that's, an, that's another story for another <laughs> day. Um, but yeah, it was just like, it was kind of heartbreaking. And I was depressed for a while after that because I'm like, here, I just put all these weeks of just like hundred percent effort into this and felt like that I got robbed. So I got like, it was just devastating. I'm like, you know, bodybuilding stupid, that type of thing. Like, yeah. why am I killing myself for what? Just to have a couple people, you know, kind of rob me out of something. So it was like a very dark experience after that. And I remember in 2004, my brothers, he wanted to compete. He's like, Hey, do the shows with me. I'm like, nah, I don't want to do it. I just like, did not want to do it. So he talked me into it, but my heart wasn't in it. 
And it wasn't until 2009, like as a transition from like 2002, you know, I did shows in 2004. I did one in 2000, a couple in 2006, but I just, it wasn't like the right perspective. It was still, I'm trying to win these shows. Mm -hmm. But in 2009, after a lot of like, just thinking for like two, three years from 2006, to 2009, where I'm, and I took into account all those, that 2002 experience, I was like, I'm going to do this season just for the fun of it and just do it and, and meet people backstage and try to, you know, meet friends. Cause it was never about that. It was always about trying to win, you know, that competitiveness. And so that whole season in 2009 I was like, let's just have fun. And when I got to the show, I mean, I still got in great shape and all that. And that's when I met Eric and Alberto and like, I probably wouldn't have like mingled with those guys backstage if I had the same mentality as I did in the past. And obviously having that mindset and that perspective, look where I am now um, with 3D Muscle Journey, it would have never existed. Yeah. So it was like, I'm just going to enjoy this experience. And I ended up winning two pro cards that season. So go figure, right? So mm -hmm. I was just in a much more relaxed state with the process too. It wasn't like, as I wasn't putting as much pressure on myself to be like, quote unquote, the best. I was like, hey, just get in shape, go have fun and just get the experiences. And it just, it just turned out perfect. Like I enjoyed bodybuilding again. It was like a different purpose. And I remember that's when I started uh, my blog or vlog, whatever you want to call it, call 3D Muscle Journey. Yeah. That was before Eric and all these, knowing these guys. And I started like the natural movement on there and it was trying to give notoriety and some, some attention for natural bodybuilders. It's like, Hey, you know, we, we work hard, you know, let's, you know, we're not getting a lot of attention. So that was kind of my thing. I was like, Hey, let's see if we can get this sport out there a little bit more. So I had a different purpose. It was like more, not about me. It was more about, Hey, let's, let's make everything better as a whole. So I think that just, um, it just helped me out a lot moving forward after that. It's like, just change the total dynamic of why I was, I was bodybuilding. Yeah. So, so that 2002 season was kind of like a pretty good turning point for you to where it was like, man, there's yeah. may, maybe my focus is a little off here. And then it's, it's crazy how you kind of can connect the dots going backwards like that. And there's like, man, if this season didn't happen, then that 2009 season might not have happened. And 3DMJ might not have happened. And yeah. it's crazy with that. It is crazy how it works. And like, even if let's say I did win that 2002, I don't think I was ready to be a pro. Mm -hmm. Like just the mentality, the mindset, um, just a lot of immaturity still. Um, and we're talking a 31 year old guy that's been in the sport for a long time. It was like, I, so it's kind of a blessing that I didn't win there. And I won in 2009 with that mindset, mindset perspective. Cause here, okay. I just won a couple of pro cards. Great. But now I can use that to help further like p other people. Like I could help more people now because mm -hmm. of that. So that, yeah. So I think it just kind of works out worked out good for me. Like I'm glad that the journey that I've taken is kind of like unraveled the way it has. Yeah, definitely. And this time around, have you, is the most difficult part this time around been kind of the activity piece of things when thinking about like getting contest lean, is that the kind of the most difficult part? Yeah, this perhaps been, it's been the fat loss part of it. Just because, like, like you said, the inactivity. I tried prepping in 2017, 20, yeah, 2017, 2016, 2017, trying to hit the stage there. It didn't work out, failed. Yeah. Um, it wasn't the actual weight loss. It was actually the training because I was, had a lot of injuries, aches and pains. Um, so it's kind of flipped around this time, uh, which I'll take this side better. Like I know, okay, all I have to do is maybe just do more cardio or lower food down a little bit here and there. It'll make it happen. But the training aspect, man, it's like, it doesn't get any, any easier the older you get. Like, you know, I'm going to be hitting 48 in, in June. So it doesn't get any easier. So I have to be very careful with the training I and mean, cautious. Um, of course, you still have to push because this is an extreme sport. I don't want to get on stage looking like I don't lift. Right. Uh, but at the same time, you got to balance it out. Like, okay, I don't want to bust myself up either to where I, I won't get on stage because I'm injured. So there's, I would say it's um, more challenging as you get older, but I'll, I'm also a lot wiser. 
Mm. Um, than I was in my heyday, you know? So I think what I truly wish is that I still had a 25 year old body, like as far as like the durability yeah. with the mindset I have now. Cause I think if that was the case, like you mix the two together. Yeah. That would, that would be like a pretty, pretty uh, great time. I think. Yeah. I know that's something that Berto talks about a little bit is how he's kind of in that range to where he thinks that, right when his, his kind of body is kind of peaking for natural bodybuilding and stuff. So is his mentality into things. And he's kind of hitting that peak to where he thinks that he's really going to hit his stride and do really well here. Yeah. I mean, he's 36. So, I mean, I'm going to be 48. So to think like, okay, where's he going to be at 48, 12 more years. Um, yeah. What, and that's the thing with me. I, I, I look back, I'm like, man, see, there was no internet back in my twenties. You know, and it wasn't until my late thirties when I kind of like started discovering like all these other types of, of ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So it was like, man, I get frustrated thinking about it, but I quickly snapped myself out of it because if I didn't go through all those hardships, then I wouldn't be the coach I am now where I can take mm -hmm. like all that experience, like that 2002 season and apply that experience towards other athletes. Now that I coach. Uh, so it kind of just helps other people avoid like the same mistakes that I've made. So I kind of like kind of think, look at it it's like, you know, it's a double edged sword. Like I wish, yeah, I had all that knowledge beforehand, but it is what it is. You know, I just roll with the punches now. And kind of throughout your training career, is there any big changes that you've made in particular to like your training method methodologies? I don't know if I could pronounce that word, but your training methods and that sort of thing, you're maybe using refeeds and diet breaks throughout a, a diet, things like that. Sure. So yeah, training, it was uh, like back in the day, I, got, I gravitated towards Mike Mintz or Dorian Yates hit because at the time, you know, Dorian Yates was Mr. Olympia. So that was kind of like, and I just kind of um, meshed with that personality, mm -hmm. like that blue collar work ethic, you know, just get in there, you know, train intense. And, you know, you're not talking to the guy next to you, you're just pounding the shit out of the weights. And, yeah you get your rest, you go home. And, and so like I gravitated towards that. So I trained in that fashion for like 15, 16 years. So it was like low volume, high intensity, plenty yeah. of rest though. That's what saved me. Um, otherwise if I would have did too much, probably would have busted myself up. Mm -hmm. um, so at least I was smart enough to know that how to balance out the intensity and the recovery. Um, but I just probably in a nutshell was training too intense, too frequently, too often and not enough volume. So I think I shortchanged myself, even though I still progress, like every off season, I would make progress. I think looking back in hindsight and optimal is always easier to see in hindsight. Yeah, I probably could have did more, more volume and things like that to mm -hmm. probably, you know, speed the process up a little bit faster. So the big change came and when I, again, when I met the other guys, like met Alberto and Eric and Brad and, you know, they're like, Hey, maybe you should back off that intensity a little bit. Why don't you add in some more volume? So started doing that after the 2009 season. So change, it took a while because I was hard headed. They're like, and I was like, nah, man, I'm not going to do that, man. What I've done is work. Hey, I just want two pro cards, that type of thing. Yeah. You know, so it's weird how winning kind of really reinforces your beliefs. Mm -hmm. Like I won shows back in the nineties and like by cutting water, like all this voodoo stuff <laughs> that you hear now, right? Like back in the day, that was, that was what you're supposed to do because mm -hmm. that's what the knowledge was at the time. And that just reinforces what you're doing because you're winning. But the reality was, was, yeah, I could have been doing a lot better. Um, so it just had like, I think the big thing was just snapping out of that, uh, just having those walls up, like letting those walls come down and letting a flood of information come in and actually like, OK, let me let me try these things they're saying. So once I started implementing some things here and there, I'm like, oh, OK, that actually worked, you know. So, again, when you see things work like in reality, they work not because of put the judging panels saying, hey, you're first place. Right. Like you actually see your physique changing for the better. You're like, OK, so now that kind of just like reinforces truly why things are working. I'm like, OK, so long story short, 2009 got on stage at 160, shredded. 2011 got on stage 10 pounds heavier, arguably in better condition. So that's 10 pounds of like pure muscle 
from a guy that went from 38 years old to 40. And everybody's like, whoa, that was a great off season. I'm like, nah, it wasn't the off season. It was okay. The combination of better training, combination of better dieting, a better prep in 2011. Because in 2009, I wasn't doing refeeds. Um, my refeeds in 2009 was like, I think I had two or three binges. <laughs> So that was my refeeds um, for that prep. Yeah. So 2009, I was refeeding like once a week back then. And they were large refeeds. Like I wasn't shy about having big refeeds. Back then, mm-hmm. it was like, I remember Eric and Roberto going, what are you doing? Stop doing that. Because mm-hmm. it was like, you should have, you know, 400 grams of carbs for your refeed. But I was like, hey, I'm going to have 800. I think looking back in hindsight, of course, blessing in disguise, I was doing that because it was preserving, helping me preserve tissue because... Mm-hmm. I was able to keep performance up. My training was like through the roof good. So yeah, in hindsight, it worked out well. So that's a couple of things that that I started to do differently um, later on. And then in 2014, that prep there, it was more refeeding, diet breaks, more diet breaks. Um, Because, you know, it was just a light bulb moment. In 2011, I'm like, okay, these big refeeds worked once a week. Let me stretch out the process even further. Like, let's have a longer timeline and lose less per week, let's mm-hmm. say. So instead of losing a pound a week, let me let me go for half a pound, three quarters of a pound. So I stretched the process out, had more refeeds, auto-regulated my training a lot more. Um, so instead of being super rigid, um, in a nutshell, like the being as rigid kind of started to fall off a little bit more. So I had to auto-regulate a little more. The size of the refeeds, the frequency of the refeeds, the training, um, the intensity, the volume, all that started to adjust it. Also, I took into consideration life because in 2014, that's when, you know, my son was like two, um, you know, and I had a stepdaughter and my wife. Whereas in 2011, it was just me and my ex-wife and we eventually got divorced that same year. So it was just me. So I didn't have to worry about, you know. This other stuff I was like, oh, I just, hey, I'm a bodybuilder 24 seven and have to worry about it. So I did things a little bit differently in 2014, a lot more auto regulation. And I realized that I don't need to be a robot. Mm-hmm. I don't need to eat at these times. I don't need to eat this much at this time either. So just a lot of more auto regulation. And it was like, OK, this physique in 2014 looks better in 2011 with more flexibility versus being super rigid. So it was kind of eye opening as well. So every prep I've done, whether it's been successful or not, I've learned more and more about myself, but also learned more about about how to prep. And it's helped transcend into coaching other athletes because I realized like, oh, shit, if all these tools can work for me, then they're going to work for different individuals as well within context. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it was kind of eye open. It's been eye opening. So hopefully that answered your question as far as some of the changes and philosophies that have taken. Yeah, for sure. And I'd kind of like to dive into a little bit more on like your, your approaches to kind of auto regulating things. So maybe we'll we'll first start on kind of the refeeds and diet breaks. So are you still kind of taking a more or less kind of auto regulated approach with those? Or is it kind of structured out ahead of time? Or how are you kind of approaching those this time around? It's a good question. So let me give context first. So, cause I'm sure there's going to be all different types of listeners here. Yeah. Keep in mind that I've been doing this for, I've been training for 33 years and I've been prepping since the early nineties. So I know myself extremely well and I would consider myself experienced, you know? Mm-hmm. So I would to keep that in mind. So when I auto regulate, it's with that understanding. It's not like, I'm in my first ever prep and I'm like, Oh, I'm tired today. I'm going to refeed. Yeah. Yeah. So on some days you just got to grind shit out. Um, Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, it's, I, I have a structure and I have a structure, but within the structure, there's plenty of flexibility. So like, for example, the structure I'm running with nutrition is five, five low days, two high days. So five low days in a row, followed up with two, two high days. Um, all my cardio, I try to keep within the low days. I don't try to do cardio on my refeed days. I don't, I'll train on my refeed days on occasion. But the reason I don't like to do cardio and my training on refeed days, because I want that food to go towards recovery. I want to be able to say, okay, you know, more carbs here so I can, you know, restore glycogen, get my energy levels top back off. 
Um, and not just from a physical standpoint, but from a mental and emotional standpoint, it's nice to have two days where you're just chilling, you know, and yeah. I'm going to eat this homemade pizza here with my family on a Saturday night and watch a movie, mm-hmm. you know? So that's kind of like how my system is as far as the nutrition, but the refeeds, like I auto regulate them as far as the size based on where my rate of loss has been. So let's say I had a, a good week where I lost the pound off um and i would say i'm like feeling a little bit more run down and tired because of that like i dug pretty good then i'm gonna have a little bit larger refeeds to fill the hole up a little bit um if let's say i only lost a quarter pound then hey you know these refeeds they're either going to be smaller in nature or i'm only going to have one maybe or yeah. zero i'm like hey let's just push the low days out a little further so instead of five low now i'm going to run six or seven maybe eight or nine if I need to, mm-hmm. to get that rate of loss I'm after, then I'll go ahead and throw refeeds in there to fill the hole. Like what I don't want to do those, let's say dig hard and just say, okay, keep digging hard and create like a huge, huge hole. That's hard to get out yeah. of because you're a little more susceptible to like performance drop offs and things like that. You're also more susceptible to being an asshole, right? Yeah. Like more fatigue you get. So I don't want that to happen. So kind of take all those factors into consideration and that's how I kind of determine where those refeeds are. And again, it's, it, they're structured, like I said, five low, two high, the two high, it's like for me, like a smaller refeed would be, let's say 300 grams of carbs. Mm-hmm. Um, a high one would be like five to 600. Okay. So I have a range there. And again, based on like what my rate of loss is, how beat up I'm feeling, how tired I am, irritable, that type of thing. Um, I gauge where those need to be. And the beauty of this is that because I don't have like that quote unquote hard timeline, then I can afford to be a little more like if I need a bigger refeed, I can say, okay, I can do it here. Cause let's say I take, let's say this weekend I'm feeling really shitty, uh, which I am by the way. Um, (laughs) and I take two bigger refeeds and let's say my weight spikes up a, a bit, you know, goes up two, three, four pounds or whatever doesn't mean, Hey, okay. You just shot yourself in the foot. Now you're regressing. It just means like, okay, maybe instead of five low days coming up, maybe I need to push it to six or seven mm-hmm. and let again, get to where I need to go. Okay. So this week I want to lose X amount of weight. Okay. I'll push it out, dig, and then fill it back up later. So if you have hard timelines where you're, especially if you're like, you're like, shit, I need to lose, you know, 10 pounds in, in, six weeks, you know, your show's in six weeks, you lose 10. Well, guess what? You don't have the flexibility anymore. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to lose a shit ton of weight every single week to make your quota. Then you got to hope and pray after the six weeks is over. You don't, you don't look like a a stick on stage. Mm -hmm. So, so that's kind of like the mentality I have or philosophy I have around personally, the way I do my nutrition with shows on the training front. Um, do you want me to go into that right now? The, the the only follow up that I was going to say was yeah, that go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I I just, know I'm no, you're good. I was just going to say that I really like how you still use like an objective measure of your weight along with how you're feeling and stuff, because I think for a lot of people, it could be really easy to, like you said, if they are less experienced to just be rationalizing with themselves. OK, I need like three high days in a row here when in reality, if they haven't lost any weight, then they might not need that, you know? Yeah, as a coach, like with some of my athletes that are, you know, they're not that experienced first prep or whatever. It's like it's easy to get it wrapped up in the the weight, like the numbers, like everything's based on those numbers. Oh, I didn't meet my quota. Right. Uh, so there's like some things you take into consideration, like what I take into consideration, like if they report in, let's say they only lost like a quarter pound and they're they're in, most of the time the instinct is all oh, we need to push harder. But, you know, in the, rep- the check in, they're telling me I'm tired. I'm having a hard time recovering from training. Um, you know, there's more sore than normal. Um, hunger's high. Um, like to me that like, yeah, some sometimes you just say, you know what? Oh, yep, we got to suck it up here and dig harder. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's other times where you like, you know what? It'd probably be a bad idea if I lower this person's food or jack their cardio way up and dig harder because maybe depending on the person's uh, mentality like that can break somebody Mm -hmm. like okay yeah let's lower your food down then all of a sudden three days later they're binging so you're shooting yourself in the foot like that would be that's the bad call it's like uh, maybe this person needs 
you know, an extra refeed or two, maybe need to pull back on training just a little bit. So if you think about supply and demand, I use this analogy all the time, supply and demand, like that demand might be so high and the supply is too low that there's a breaking point there. So it's like, Hey, let's just balance that supply and demand out temporarily. That way you're feeling a lot better. Like, okay, I feel good now. Now I can go ahead and push again. Then we say, okay, now we're going to go on a five, six, seven, eight day run where we go really dig hard Mm -hmm. because they're in a better position. You could think of it like a race car driver too. You're out on the track for hundred laps. Your, your tires are going to start wearing down. Your gas is getting low. You got to bring the car in, pit stop mm-hmm. it, and then throw it back out there on the track so they can race even harder and better the next 100. So that's kind of, uh, you know, again, my philosophies around that. Yeah, it plays to the importance of making sure to take in the entire context rather than just one single variable. Because like you said, yeah. the initial reaction to not losing any, mo- any weight might be, okay, let's increase this deficit somehow. But mm-hmm. on the flip side, the the best approach might be, OK, let's actually pull back a little bit here, refuel a little bit, you know, have a pit stop and then continue the deficit. Exactly. Yeah, I think today, in today's day and age with the science and the research and all that, especially the, what I see anyways, I could be wrong. But just with a lot of younger bodybuilders are like getting into it, they look at the science as it's like the end all be all, which mm-hmm. We do need the science because it does help make our methods better, but you also have to take an experience level and experiences. And this is real life. You know, we're not freaking robots. And that's what frustrates me a lot is like when I see people preaching, like we're in a, it's like all about being robotic. And it's like, no, man, it's like, you're dealing with a lot of, we're humans. There's emotions involved. Mm -hmm. You know, there's physicality the mentality experiences, all that goes into play. And I think, um, when you start to realize that and you kind of like make all that a part of the process, that's how you become an advanced bodybuilder. Yeah, for sure. And I'll, sometimes I'll, I'll hear people kind of play lip service of, Oh, okay. So yeah, there might be some potential psychological benefits to a refeed or something like that, but does it really help like physio physiologically and man, it's, it's almost like they're not, not realizing that that psychological component is huge when you're considering dieting for over the long term. I don't think of it like this too. Let's say you're a caveman back in the ice age and food is not like abundant and you're like eating scraps here and there and you're slowly starving to death. You're going to tell me that if there's uh, an animal ahead, you got a spear in it, you're not going to kill it and eat the whole thing and that you wouldn't feel better after that. Mm -hmm. physically, mentally, and emotionally. I mean, no brainer. I mean, come on, it's common sense when you think about it from that perspective. But because we're in this civilized world where bodybuilding is a sport, get on stage with shredded abs, like that's not a normal thing. It's normal because we're civilized. But back in that, if you were, you know, 6% body fat as a, as a caveman, you'd be worried. Yeah. 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 The, 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 the fat guy next to you is going to slap you silly Mm because he's got the energy and the strength where you just like, yeah. But anyways, yeah. Yeah. Tangent. No, that that's great. And now I think would be a good place to kind of transition into the the auto regulating your training side of things. So how are you kind of approaching that during this contest prep? Same kind of philosophy. Like I have a structure, but plenty of flexibility within it. So again, I know myself really, really well. And like, it's kind of hard to explain because if I say, I'm not low volume, but other people think I'm low volume because I only do like three exercises per training session. Mm -hmm. Uh, So other people are going to look at that and go, yeah, you're low volume. Yeah. In comparison to everybody else. But for me, like whatever I'm doing, it's kind of like, think of it like a baseline. Uh, So I have my structure in place. It's a baseline. And then the volume will kind of go up and down depending on how I'm feeling and where I'm at in the process of what I'm doing. So just kind of a training overview quickly. Five training sessions is what I run. Doesn't mean I train five days a week. It just means I have five training sessions. So if things line up great, like in a given week, then I'll get all five sessions in. If if not, let's say I'm feeling tired, um, I need more, more recovery, I'll take you know extra rest days. So it might be a four-day training week, might even be a three-day training week based on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just keep the five s- training sessions going in succession. So if I okay. do four this week, I just next week I pick it up with the fifth one and so on. So 
most of the time I'm hitting each body part like twice every seven to 10 days. That's usually the average. And also take into consideration too, like, you know, family and all that. So if we have like a busy week and I can't train five days and it's four or three. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean, flexibility with the frequency. And even in the off season too, like if I'm trying to put muscle on, it's kind of the same thing. And I know some people are like, oh man, you should be hitting every body part twice every seven days. Like, here's the thing. Let's say you train twice every nine days, let's say. You really think those two days you're going to see atrophy? No. No. So the thing is, too, is like, let's say you tend to recover better with a little more, like one more extra rest day. That could potentially help your performance with the days you are training on. So Mm -hmm. maybe you get a little more volume just because you're performing better. Um, even though you're training less frequently. So that's something that I've noticed with myself. Like when I try to train a little too frequently or a little too much, a little too much volume at times, um, I just don't recover as well. And what I found too, is I don't necessarily need to do a lot of volume, like through sets. Um, so yeah, I just, I kind of just look at it from that perspective. I know you've talked in the past about kind of calling audibles with your training, like within like, Maybe it's you show up on that day and you're just kind of not feeling it. What might be an example of like an audible that you call or any indicators that you're looking for, for, Hey, it might not be a good idea to push it today. Gotcha. Yeah. So within my training sessions, those three movements, like I'll have, like, it's not super rigid as far as the number of sets reps, um, you know, the intensity level, it's like, I have ranges. So everything's through, through principles. Like I designed my training program for myself through a principle. So mm-hmm. let's say for example, RDL, that's a good one lately. Cause that one's been flying well. Yeah. So I have the sets are anywhere between two to four sets. And my rep range on a heavier session is like five to six reps. And then reps in reserve is like anywhere between one and three. So if I go into a training session, um, like one, one, I, I remember I could recall, I game plan this cause I wanted to have a good RDL heavy session. Like I want to just have like, try to hit some PRs. So I'm like, I kind of took an extra rest day that week to push that session back a little further. So I have one more recovery day and I made it on a Monday. So that way my Saturday, Sunday refeeds, I can take those to fill up. So when I got in the gym on Monday, I had plenty of rest and I had plenty of food in me. So I'm like, okay, today's the day. And I made sure to sleep well on Sunday night and that type of thing. So Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I can push it here. And when I actually got into the gym, I'm like, okay, this is the load I'm going to attempt on my first set. And that was based off of the last heavy session. Like I knew, okay, the last session was this amount, this many reps I got, and it felt this way. So I feel confident with this load to start with this load. From there, it was like, okay, let's see what happens. You know, so once I did the first set and I was like, oh, that felt actually good or i was like okay it's two to three in the tank so i knew okay the next set i can maintain that load and that's kind of how i base it i just like okay i look at like what i did previously was it good or not yes or no okay now i can actually try to attempt this okay now was that first set where it needed to be as far as the number of reps i hit was it fall within my range or the reps in reserve within my range and if so, was it one rep in reserve or was it three? So that'll help me gauge the next set's load. So that's kind of how I do things. It's like, okay, look at the past and look at what I'm doing in the future. I mean, what I'm doing in the present and that helps me gauge things. Um, now let's say that training session, like the first set didn't go too well. then of course I'm going to go, okay, yeah, I got to back to load down or whatever. Mm-hmm. Now there's some sessions, um, where I go into it feeling pretty beat up and yeah, I'll say, you know what, today might be like one of those days where I'm going to go on the lower side of the set range. So let's say it's another movement where it's three to six sets. I'm going to say, okay, might be better to do three sets here. Um, maybe on the lower side of the rep range and the higher side of the reps and reserve range. So in a sense, kind of like a auto-regulated deload session. Yeah. And so that's another thing is like, I don't have structured deload weeks. I do for my athletes, but not for myself. Cause again, experience level take, mm-hmm. plays a big role in that. Um, so yeah, I just like, if I need to go light on a session, I'll do it. And, or if I need to take a day off, I'll do it. That's like a mini deload, if you will. So if I, let's say I'm trying to train five days this week, I only train three. Well, I got two more recovery days. So 
if I don't feel good enough after that much rest and a little more refeeding, then I mean, yeah, more than likely I will. So mm. that's kind of how I do things. Gotcha. So you kind of, you kind of pay attention, you pick your spots a little bit. Okay. So after these couple of refeeds, I'm thinking that I'm going to be feeling good, but when you show up that day, you still kind of assess based on how your performance was and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm sure you've you've trained, so I'm sure you've gotten into a training session. You're going into it, you're like, man, I'm gonna crush shit. You're feeling really yeah. good, and that first set, you're like, ooh, that day didn't feel too good. Yeah. Where you've actually, it could be the flip side too, because I've had training sessions where I didn't feel good going into it, and all of a sudden you're like, where did that come from? Mm-hmm. You know, you pull a PR. So I also like on those days too. It's not to say like I go into it thinking this might be a lighter session, but I still, I'm still that first set and see how it feels. And if yeah. it feels like, oh, that felt light, even though I'm tired, I'm going to get after it a little bit. Mm-hmm. So the, I, I think I just have, like, again, the experience level, but paying attention to a lot of the the outside factors, like sleep, where the food is at, just where your overall energies are feeling, things like that. Like, even stress, too. Like, yeah. you know, hard day at work or, hey, you know, uh, not to say that I fight with my wife because I don't, but I know people do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's like, you know, I take these things into consideration, um, you know, heading into my training because the last thing I want to do is let's say I am feeling really terrible and I do, let's say push high volume, like the recovery is probably not going to be there after that. So mm-hmm. it could impact the rest of, let's say your training week. If you're like getting after it, maybe a little too much in the, in the, you know, you're not in the right position to do so. So even with when I coach my athletes, it's like, yeah, I like to systemize the training. Let's systemize the volume, systemize the intensity. And, you know, you can make it rigid, but sometimes it's not going to fall into place too well. Like, let's say it's a high, high volume, supposed to be a high volume week, according to the spreadsheet. Right. Mm -hmm. But you're working, let's say 60 hours and you usually work 40. Let's say uh, you got five hours sleep all week instead of your typical eight. Um, Your food level, let's say you're just a little off on nutrition just because you're like, shit, I can't find the time to eat because I'm so busy. Mm -hmm. That's like, to me, that's like, that would be the most dumbest time to try to run a high volume week. You're going to run yourself into the ground. Then what's next week's training going to look like? So that's why I mean like, okay, that the spreadsheet says, Hey, I should be doing five sets, six sets here, but maybe it's more wise to do three Mm -hmm. or a take an extra day or two off of training. So you can get the stuff outside of the gym a little more in order before you, you go after it again. And you're a little more risk at risk for injury too. If you're training in that type of uh, stressful environment. Yeah. So something to think about too, it's like, yeah, we want to make progress. We want to get after it, but at the same time, you want to be able to do it 33 years later, like I am as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And have you found it difficult to kind of give yourself that, that flexibility over time? Cause like, even, even for myself thinking about it right now, it's like, man, I, I've had this plan planned out and I'm just going to be hard headed and stick to my plan because when I planned it out, I was in a reasonable state of mind. And right now I could just be rationalizing with myself. So I'm just going to stick to the plan. Have you found that kind of difficult? I did in my twenties. Yeah. When it was, when I was, like I said, it was hardcore. Well, I remember one, one day in particular, and I'm not too proud of this moment, but my ex-wife was like scared of like severe storms and that type of thing. It was nasty mm-hmm. outside. Like, yeah, it's pretty scary. But like, I got to go train. And she's like, no, I don't want to, you know, I, I want you here. I don't want you to leave. I'm like, no, I'm not missing that training day. Yeah. Do you really think if I would have missed that training day, like all of a sudden I would start seeing regression or atrophy or anything like that? Not that was all. just, that was just, again, being selfish and being just very driven. Like I was very driven in my twenties. Not to say I'm not driven now. I still want to make progress, but I yeah. also, I can see things with, with, from different perspectives now. Like, okay, missing one training session because of, you know, whether it's, you know, that type of an issue where it's like an outside related issue or whatever. I feel tired. I just can't train or whatever. It's not like sometimes you're better off taking a step back so you can take two steps forward. That's hard. It's a, it's hard to, to have that mentality when you're very driven for progress. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, again, experience level comes into play. Especially, let's say you're not where you want to be as far as development, 
like physical development. Like I want to be jacked. Yeah. I want to, if I don't train today, man, I'm not going to get to where I want to go. So yeah, it is hard. Um, it takes discipline, but I think once, and probably a lot of people who might be listening to who's been training for a while, probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Once you realize that, man, it just, you become more at peace with the process. You actually can enjoy the process more because you're not like a stress ball so much trying to make so much progress. Yeah. You let that stress go. You can actually enjoy it more. And enjoyment is a huge part of longevity. Like if you're not enjoying what you're doing, how far do you think you're going to go? Not very. <laughs> you, you, yeah. You might, you might last a year or two years, maybe five years. You're doing something. So like this, eventually you're going to be like, fuck, I'm so burned out. Yeah. And that's happened to me a couple of times through the years too. I got burned out or I'm like, fuck, I just, this is getting old. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, yeah, I'm so at peace with the process. And that's why I think some people online, they're like, God, oh, this guy's, he doesn't train that hard anymore. You know, he's always talking about like this longevity thing. Um, yeah. But that's not the case, man. I'm just training a lot smarter. And yeah, so yeah, I'm rambling again. But anyways. No, no, that's, I think that's a really important point to make. And I think that, you know, the more like for myself in ways, the more like secure I am with how I'm looking and with the progress I've made, the more I can just enjoy what I'm doing and kind of give myself a little bit more flexibility to where it's like, man, I'm already like kind of pretty cool with how I look at it, things like that. So I, why have I tried to be so rigid when it just doesn't make sense? Like if there's a winter yeah. snowstorm outside, why am I, why don't I just push this training day one day back or something like that, you know? Yeah, push it back a day or, you know what, hey, man, I'm going to do some push-ups instead, you know, because... Yeah. Get I mean, something in, but... Yeah, it's not like, you, like I said, you miss a day, it's not like all of a sudden you're going to see atrophy. You literally mm -hmm. have to stop training, like, two, three, four weeks to see atrophy. Yeah. You know, even mm -hmm. if you did, it's like, because I've had those layoffs where I've had, like, a four-month layoff. Yeah, I lost some size and I lost strength and I was like, fuck, I, look, I don't look that great. But, man, like a month later... You know, back in it's the gym, back, yeah. there it is. Yeah. So yeah. like, again, those are the experiences I've gone through. That's giving me the, the amount of uh, maturity, like mindset maturity that I have now is because I've gone through a lot and seen a lot. Yeah. And the, the very final thing I'd like to ask you, and it's probably relates to a lot of the stuff we've talked about today is what advice would you give a younger individual like myself? That's kind of maybe maybe in their 20s that are kind of getting into this what what advice looking back would you be like hey man you should probably focus on this in regards to like your training lifestyle nutrition any of that stuff i think the the big thing is just having that open mind like i talked on I talked about earlier whether it's science or whatever whatever it is just have an open mind that mm -hmm. that in my opinion like what I've experienced over the years is that there is no right or wrong. There's context. So something could be wrong now, but it might be right later or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So having an open mind and realizing that the sport isn't black or white, it's more about gaining more and more knowledge as you go along and filling up a toolbox because there's going to be circumstances in the future for you that you're going to need a specific tool to help you progress. Um, so for example, let's say you have achy, achy elbows or something like that and you can't do heavier loads. Well, you can do BFR. Um, but if you have no clue what BFR is, you don't know how to uh, apply it, then how are you going to progress? Yeah. So that's just the one example of many. So when you, when you, ask questions try to think of asking questions not from a black or white perspective and that's a lot of questions i get is from coming from a black or white perspective like hey jeff why are you doing those floor presses the range of motion is is limited so you're not going to get as much volume you know mm -hmm. a lot of black well one you don't know my context i got a bum shoulder yeah. i can't do regular bench pressing because of pain this is the only movement i can do pain free and i mean arguably you know the floor press has there's not, there's no stress reflex there. So there's more tension arguably. Mm -hmm. So that can kind of make up for that range of motion. So it's kind of like splitting hairs. For and sure. even let's say you go from, let's say that range of motion to this one, that's a new baseline. 
Like, mm-hmm. like again, you're not going to see regression because you went from a bench press to a floor press. Right. You're all of a sudden your muscle ain't going to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. So that becomes your new baseline. And if you progress on that lift over time, your volume goes up anyways. Right. So I think sometimes, like if like sometimes you just you gotta let go of that minutia, have an open mind, and realize that you know it's again not black or white. It's just all about context, um, and that can apply for life too, not just bodybuilding. Yeah, for and that's sure. something that I've learned over the years too. Having a more principle based approach and applying that to a certain context for sure. Exactly. Cool. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate you coming on. Where can people find you, find more about you and that sort of thing? 3dmusclejourney.com, 3dmj godfather on Instagram. And that's the two go-tos. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much for checking this podcast out. Make sure to screenshot it, put it on your store. I really appreciate each and every one of you for doing that. And I will see you in that next one.